The Buddha recognizes that there's an element of pain and suffering in being on the path. There's some parts of the path that are difficult. And when you look at the path and you look at where you are, it seems like it's a long way away to the end. The body says that the pain of being on the path is a lot better than the pain of not being on the path. The path may seem long, but it's a lot shorter than the alternative, which just wanders around and doesn't really get anywhere. Because it doesn't get anywhere in particular, it keeps going around and around and around, or it's more like squiggles all over the place. This path at least goes someplace. And so to overcome the pain of being on the path, you should learn how to look at the good side of being on the path and realize that. It's not all painful. It's not a path through a desert that finally, at the very end of the path, gets you to an oasis. It's a path through some really nice countryside. In fact, some parts of the countryside are so nice that people tend to stop and spend some time there. You look at the description of right concentration. Pleasure and rapture born of seclusion. And seclusion here can mean partially means physical seclusion when you get away from all the concerns of your daily life, all your responsibilities. There's a sense of relief. Even more so when you develop what's called mental seclusion. And even though you may have carried a lot of baggage here, you can put it out at the gate. all the voices inside that you tend to have conversations with. You can let them go for the time being. Give them some freedom, too. You can be right here with the breath. Because when you focus on the path, remember, it's one step at a time, as we were saying earlier today. Right now the next step is the next breath, and then the next breath, and then the next breath. And then if you find yourself wandering away from the breath, okay, drop whatever it is, and you'll be right back at the breath. You don't have to pull yourself back. This is the natural place for the mind to be. You drop the other thought, and here you are with your breathing. Now, to stay here requires several things. On the one end, you have to be alert to what's going on. At the same time, you have to have some strategies for making this a nice place to be. You're trying to make this your home. In fact, that's one of the Pali terms for meditation, Vihara Dhamma. It's the place where the mind makes its home. So how do you make a home out of the breath? Well, in the same way you make a house into a home. You bring in some furniture that you like, you decorate the walls, you paint it the color you like, you put some books on the shelves. In this case, this means making the breath really comfortable. And when you have trouble staying with the breath, use some other Dharma themes to keep yourself content. They're what they call the guardian meditations to help keep the mind in line. First is recollection of the Buddha. You think of how amazing it was. Here was someone who had lots of potential for being, having a position of power, wealth. all the sensual pleasures that a person in a position like that could have. And he realized it wasn't worth it. As a husband and a father, he wanted something better to give to his wife and his child. So he went off, like men would do in those days, to find his fortune. But in this case, the fortune was something else. It was the deathless. As he said, the pleasure that comes from things that can die and leave you. And that's not just things, of course, people. Leaves you empty-handed. All that effort that goes into maintaining a relationship, all that effort that goes into maintaining your things, your position, your power, whatever, 
it all goes, and there's the effort, gone. He wanted something of more lasting value. It re really repaid its efforts. In other words, you put the effort in, and then you've got something that doesn't change. And he found it. He came back and he taught it to his family. He taught it to all beings. He was willing to teach anybody who was capable of being taught. That's pretty amazing. Think of famous people nowadays. How many people can you think of who would actually leave all their fame and fortune and power or whatever and go off into the forest, subject themselves to the kinds of torment that the Buddha subjected himself to before he really found the path, and then would come back and teach it for free to everybody? That's a pretty amazing individual. And that's the person who found the path that we're following. Now, thinking of the Buddha seems a little bit too far and high up for you. You can think of the Sangha. There are passages in the canon where the members of the Sangha, monks and nuns, talk about their, their troubles meditating. They found themselves getting waylaid on the path one way or the other. One nun talks about how she had become a famous Dharma teacher, and then she realized she had nothing inside. It's all the fame and fortune that came from being a teacher. She realized how empty it was, so she dropped it. There are monks and nuns talking about how they were ready to commit suicide. They were so upset about how their path of practice didn't seem to be going anywhere. Fortunately, they didn't commit suicide. They stopped themselves in time and ultimately were able to get on the path. Bringing the reflection to this level makes it seem a little bit more human. But you have to remember, the Buddha was human too. He shows the possibility of what human beings can do. And most importantly, he found that through our efforts we can find something that is deathless, that doesn't require a continued effort to keep it going. And when that's a possibility, it's worth our effort to see if we can do that ourselves. Second guardian meditation is goodwill. Having goodwill for yourself, goodwill for other beings. If this doesn't mean that you're going to love them or that you're going to look after them. What it means is you wish them well, whether they're with you or not with you, whether you like them or not. What does it mean to wish them well? You wish that they find true happiness. True happiness has to come from each person's actions. We can't do true happiness for each other. We can make things pleasant for one another, but the true happiness is something that has to be found within. So what you're doing is you're wishing that that person would understand the causes for true happiness, act on them until gaining results. And when you stop to think about that, that's something you can wish for all beings even people who are currently very evil. It would mean that they'd have to realize that they've been following the wrong path and be willing to change their ways. Now, there are a lot of cases where people are not willing to do that, which, in which case the Buddha teaches equanimity, realizing that there are limitations on what we can do and on how many people we can actually help, or when we can help them based on our karma, their karma. And so you have to focus your efforts in areas where you can be of benefit, either for yourself or others, and not keep pushing against a brick wall. So equanimity is what brings wisdom into your goodwill. If you find that you're having trouble staying with the breath, you can use goodwill as a way of reminding yourself that this is why you're here. It's for your true happiness. That's because you really do wish yourself well. So it's not a burden that's being placed on you. There are difficulties in the practice, but you're following this practice because you wish yourself well. You're not trying to punish yourself. Now, two is another guardian meditation. Again, this is like the books you keep in your house. to make the house a home. The third book on the shelf is Contemplation of the Foulness of the Body. 
Now, they, that may not sound like a book you'd like to have on your shelf, but it's very useful when you realize that a lot of our concerns in lifetime center around this body. And we can do an awful lot of unskillful things in our concern for maintaining the body, giving ourselves physical pleasure. We can do a lot of foolish things under the power of lust for other people's bodies. It's just good to have this as, a, as an antidote. And some people complain that it's giving you a negative body image, but it's, it's a healthy negative body image. An unhealthy one would be if you think of your body as ugly and everybody else's as beautiful. A healthy negative body image is that we're all in the same boat. You take the skin off of everyone and we wouldn't be able to look at anybody. If you put your livers out here on the floor, we wouldn't be able to say who had the most beautiful liver. And you think about all the issues in life that are around bodies. At the same time, the Buddha has us develop positive, healthy, healthy, positive body image. In other words, realizing the body is very useful. Without it, we wouldn't be able to meditate. We wouldn't be able to practice generosity. So he's not down on the body. When we're meditating here, we're trying to fill our awareness with good breath energy in the body. So it's not that the body's a bad thing, it's just you have to learn how to have the right attitude. So we want a healthy, positive body image, and an unhealthy, positive body image would be one where, okay, my body's more beautiful than other people, I'm better than other people because I'm more beautiful. That kind of attitude. That's setting you up for a fall, because beauty doesn't last. You see all the things that people do to keep scrambling after it as they're realizing that they're losing the youth that they used to have. So again, this contemplation of the foulness of the body is good for counteracting an unhealthy positive image and replacing it with a healthy negative image and a healthy positive image. So this is a good book to have on your shelf in the house, your home of concentration. The final one is recollection of death. Death is going to come to all of us. And as the Buddha said, the purpose of this reflection is to help us, help motivate us to find the deathless. In other words, it's not there just to get you depressed. Most people don't like to think about death because they figure, well, what can I do? I'm just going to die. They don't think about preparing for it aside from maybe putting aside some money for their medical, medical bills, making a directive for whether they want to be resuscitated or not. But that's not really preparing for it, because when we die, we don't, things don't stop. The consciousness does not have to depend on the body. Consciousness can go simply on craving and find itself in a new body. So what kind of cravings are you associating with here? This is another reason why it's good to have some seclusion, because our main companion as we go through life, or our main companions, are our cravings. And when we can't stay with the body anymore, that we'll latch on to one of them, or a whole passel of them. You know, like eels, they can go off every which way. So what are the eels that you've got inside yourself right now? But as you reflect on death every day, every morning when the sun rises, remind yourself, this could be my last day. Am I ready to go? Is there anything in the mind that would make it really difficult for me to go right now? Well, you're you can probably think of quite a few things. Those are things you can work on today. Every evening when the sun sets, remind yourself, I could go today. I'm ready to go. Any unfinished business, either inside or out, that's really important. It helps us make the most of our time, because time gets, gets eaten away, eaten away, and it can't be brought back. We can remember it, try to call it back in our memories, but then that just slips away as well. When the Buddha has us focus on the present moment, it's because, as he said, death is imminent. It's not here. We're not here because it's a nice place to be or it's a wonderful moment or whatever. We're here because there's work to be done, and this is the place to do it in your mind right now.
So this recollection is good for days when you're feeling kind of lazy, or you find yourself slipping into unskillful habits, either in your meditation or when you're dealing with other people. To remind you there's important work to be done, and you don't know how much time you have to do it, so the best time to do it is now. So these are some of the, the books in your library, in your concentration home. In other words, when the breath starts getting boring or you're tired of being with the breath, you can take one of these books off the bookshelf. You can leave through the recollection of the Buddha, goodwill, contemplation of the body, contemplation of death. Of course, the purpose of this reading is to make you realize okay, you're ready to put the book down and get back to the breath. Because the breath is your anchor in the present moment, so that you can see events in the mind as they come up and you don't get pulled off into the little worlds that they create for you. Worlds of the past, worlds of the future, worlds of someplace else. The breath is your world right here. So you want to have a sense of being rooted here. And John Fung used to say, when you're sitting and meditating, think of roots growing out of the base of your spine going down into the ground. You're solidly here. You're here with a breath. And you find that when you learn how to stay here, this is really a position of strength. When you develop this skill, you can take this strength back with you. It's useful to have a quiet set of surroundings to work on it, but as you get more used to it, you find that this really is where you feel at home, and there's no need to leave it. You can be with a breath and still be aware of the world outside, aware of what you have to think about, but you've always got this place to come back to, and because you've learned how to furnish it well. You're familiar with the breath energies in the different parts of the body and the different things they can do. The times when it's good to have a feeling that the breath energy is moving up through the body as you breathe in. Other times when it's good to have a feeling that it's moving down through the body as you breathe in. Or breathing in and out from every pore so that you breathe into a line that goes down the center of the body and then breathe out from that line. There are lots of ways of exploring the breath energy in the body. And you begin to realize there's a whole repertoire of skills that can be associated with the breath. So make this place your home, because it should be your home. This is your area of awareness that nobody else can share, what you feel from within, how you feel the body from within, how you feel your mind from within. to fill this space with good energy. Because this can be the foundation for all the other good things you do in life.